your answer. I mean, you don't have to bring your hair. Uh, well, it's so good to see you all this morning. Uh, we have a, a very common passage. The passage is actually has a very common message. But let me start with this. Right? So we are at the final test of the Pharisees and the Sadducees to try to catch Jesus in saying the wrong things. Right? And so they come together, but instead of the Pharisees and the Sadducees asking a question, now they brought in a lawyer, an expert in the law, to test Jesus and maybe, you know, catch him saying the wrong thing. And he asked them this very interesting question. What is the greatest commandment of all? There are about 635 commandments of Moses, 635 laws of Moses within the Old Testament, right? And so basically they're saying, pick one. What is the greatest? Now, Here's what they're expecting. They're expecting him to pick one. If he does pick one of 635, then they'll say, well, how about number 47? Don't you think that's more important? How about number 62? How about number 128? How about number whatever? Isn't that more important? And that way, they can begin a fight with him and then try to discredit him in front of all the people. Jesus knows this. Omniscient knows it all. And so he gives them, does not give into it. Rather, he gives them something that is outside of the law. He says, the greatest command of all is actually something you ought to know, O oh dear scholar. And he quotes to them something every single child in Israel, from the time that they could speak to the time that they die, would say three times a day, <coughs> the Shema. The Shema is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he adds this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Basically, it's a slap on the face of a scholar. Even children know the greatest commandment of all. To love. To love. Now, it's interesting, however, that it is a command to love. Not just Jesus saying, you got to feel love for others. It's a command. So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to walk you through three different aspects of love. The first is this, uh, love is freedom. Second is this, love is bondage. And the third is this, love is obedience and an act of the will. Right? Love is freedom, love is bondage, interesting that they're different, complete opposite, and love is discipline and an act of the will. So let's start with love is freedom. How many of you have been listening to the news the last little while? What's been happening? All bad things. Shooter, killing children. Children. What else? Wars. Earthquakes still around the world. And so we have a, a Facebook page, and recently we boosted the, the choir ad. So our ad for the choir is actually going into all the phones in Odessa and Kingston. So we reach about 1,000 people a day with that ad. And so interesting, if you go on our Facebook page, you'll notice that we have, I think, almost 300 likes or something like that. And if you notice before I hide a comment, all these trolls that begin to comment on a Christian post, right? And it's, it's one, really shows how the world views the church, but also what are the questions that the world has for the church. Primarily, one of the things that is a common theme is this. With all these bad things happening around the world, how can a good and loving God allow this to happen? Why doesn't God just stop it all. Why doesn't God stop that man from pulling the trigger? Block him. Why doesn't God 
stop the wars in Israel, somehow just divinely intervene and, you know, maybe with a snap of a finger, all the planes go away, all the war planes go away. Maybe with, a, with just a word, just everyone is at peace, everyone is lovey-dovey. Why doesn't an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving God do that? You all would have thought of that too, I'm sure. Why can't God just stop all this nonsense? Well, here, the ultimate ethic of God in this world is love. The ultimate ethic. And the ultimate ethic of love says that you are valued and intrinsically valued and have worth. We talked about this last week on what it means to be made in the image of God, right? Now, if God's ethic in this world is love, <coughs> and he wants value in each and every person, the problem is you have to freely love. You have to freely love. I can't make you love. Because to make someone love does not mean that you actually love. Forced love isn't love. At best, it's a like. And so, in order for God's ethic of this world to love and to move us to be loving creatures, we have to choose the ethic of love freely. Are you with me? And so the moment God interferes with our freedom, we cannot love. But we somehow want to think and believe, one, that we know better, right? If only God could do this, and if I was God, who said that? Anyone remember? Job. If only I was God, I'd run this world differently. But we don't know what God knows. If God is moving this world towards the people that will love God and love neighbor, he has to allow for the freedom of humanity to choose otherwise. He can't take away our freedom. And so when we ask questions like, hey, shouldn't God just intervene and do this? What we're asking of God is to treat us less than human. We're asking God to treat us like robots. Take away my free will. Just make me do the right thing. And that's not how God wants his people to love. You've got to choose it. And that means in a world that is moving towards the ultimate ethic of love, there is a chance for evil to exist. But slowly and ever so slowly, in the grand scheme of things, God is calling a people to influence this world to love as he loved. That is the church. We influence a person's choice to love. So the first is this, love is freedom. But the second is this, love is bondage. Love is bondage. Once I've freely chosen to love someone or love something, I am in bondage to them. I am in a connection to them. Let's take, for example, my love for Tia. I love her. So much so that I've decided to marry her. Hey, did you know that the greatest act of trust in another human being is to take them at their word for when they say, I do? The greatest act of trust. To just take another human being's word at face value. I do. And so I've married Tia. I've trusted her. I've loved, I do love her. I trust her. I trust her and I love her. And now, I am bound to her in my love. Are you following me? I'm in bondage to her. So, I won't have sex with anybody else except Tia. In fact, no other woman in this world will pull me in that direction. I don't want it. But that's the bound bondage of my love to Tia. But when does that bondage actually feel restricting? When would a person who is married actually feel that it's okay to have sex with somebody else and okay if they pursued it? 
when does it feel like monogamy within a marriage is actually a constraint? When you don't love the person. Without love, the, the bondage of a relationship is restricting. Now, I've done marriage counseling for more than a few couples in my time here. Not, not, not in this church, in my both the churches. And here's the thing. Oftentimes, I'll ask somebody who says, I've fallen out of love. Right? A premarital counseling, probably not marriage counseling, premarital counseling. I'll say, I've fallen out of love. <clears throat> I'll say, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, give me a second. I've got to think of this. I'll tell somebody, don't cheat. Just don't cheat. And the, the person that comes to me and they say, yeah, but I feel like I can, are the people that actually don't love. They just say, I've chosen not to love my partner anymore. I've given up. I've given up. I'm done with this relationship. Oh, it's my daughter. Hi. But then those that look at me and say, when I tell them, don't cheat, they'll say, yeah, well, no, no, duh are the ones that really still love their partner. They have a committed relationship. And for them, sleeping around is not a restriction of their marriage, but a, sorry, sleeping around becomes freedom. And they feel the restriction of their marriage because they don't love them. They don't love them. Bondage is felt in a relationship only when love does not exist. However, here, when Christ says, Christ gives a command of constraint, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Those are constraints in our relationship with Jesus. Love him with all your heart means that your will be bent towards his will. To love him with all your mind means you got to know him. Get to know who he is. Love him with all your strength means that you want to do things with him and for him. And to love him with all your soul means that your entire life is about him. If I were to stop right there and I say, hey, do you love God in such a way that you're obsessed with him? That your entire being is just all about him? And do you go home every day and you just can't wait to read the Bible? Do you go around every day thinking, oh, I can't wait for my next prayer with Jesus. Do you go around thinking, oh, I wonder what else I can do to make his kingdom come? Does that sound a bit extreme, if I had to put it that way? But that's the obsession that this command calls us to, be obsessed with God. And if that sounds extreme, or if that sounds like, oh, that's way too much, then my question is simply this. Do you? love God or do you have a faint love for him? See, one of the greatest sins of a Christian is a faint love towards God. Says Tim Keller. A faint love is like this. If I were to ask Tia, Tia, why do you love me? And she looks at me and she says, yeah, I really love you, Noel, because you cut the lawn. You mow the lawn every week, which I don't do every other week. I love you, Noel, because you cook for me. I love you, Noel, because you let me sleep in so that, and then you take care of Rua. If those are the reasons she loves me, and she says, These are, this is why I love you, I'm going to feel pretty bummed. Because what does love want of the beloved? What does love want of the beloved? It wants them to want me. I want Tia to want me and to want more of me. Love wants to be known, to be wanted, and to be wanted more. Just to love them for who they are. But oftentimes, we have a faint relationship, faint love for God, where we just want Him for the things He does for us, the divine vending machine. I'm going to say my prayers, I'm going to do my Bible reading, 25 cents, 25 cents, get my Doritos, and I get my prayers answered. That's a faint love for God. A true love for God is an obsession with God. 
And none of these commands will feel like it's restricting because you love him. When you go to the word of God and it says, hey, these are the boundaries of the relationship, you'll enjoy those boundaries because you love God. You'll be able to trust things that God says, even though it may seem a bit, I don't know why. That, why are you saying that, God? I don't understand this. You trust him because you love him. Sometimes she will just do things, right? And, I, and, I'll ima- and, I, and I, my first thought is, why did she do it? My second thought is, I'm sure she's right. Which is quite often, she is right. The same thing with God. Quite often, God will just do things in our lives, ask of his things, and we just trust him. It may seem ridiculous, but within that bond of love with him, It'll make sense because we know he has in mind what is best for us. But in that perfect bondage is perfect freedom. And you know this because many of you have been married or are still. And you know that when that love is there and when you are in that committed relationship, nothing else matters. But when that love is gone, everything else matters. That's when things begin to break down. But here's the thing. I go to the third point. Love is discipline and an act of the will. No relationship is perfect. No relationship is perfect. No relationship is just the greatest thing in the whole wide world. Human. Why? And at times in our relationship, we might not love our spouse. We might not love our girlfriend or our boyfriend. And that's when this command becomes important. Because it's a command to obedience. Sometimes we look at our spouse and we just want to growl. You know what I mean? Like, I can't believe it. How in the world can I love you now? Can't believe you did that. Can't believe you said that. How dare you? And that's when the command to love becomes important. Because love is not primarily a feeling, says Robert Barron, Bishop Robert Barron, but it is an act of the will to do good for the sake of the other person. Even when you don't love them, even when you don't feel it, you love them still. Even when you don't even when you feel like you want to strangle them, you love them still. Love God, love neighbor, who's our spouse as ourselves. Even when it's difficult to love, even when it feels like I'm pouring out, I'm pouring out, I'm pouring out, but I'm getting nothing in return, God says, pour out still. Love still. How many of you here watch uh, Grey's Anatomy? We all love Grey's Anatomy, don't we? Uh, who, who, is, uh, who does Meredith, uh, I forget his name. Derek, thank you. Okay, there's this time Meredith and Derek are going out, right? But then Derek's ex-wife comes into the picture, and he has to choose between Meredith and Derek. And there's this beautiful, beautiful speech that I think it's like taken over the internet, taken over my mind for many years. So Meredith goes up to Derek uh, after he's done surgery, and she says, Pick me. Choose me. Love me. At what point does that love, that love me is a command, but it's also a plea. Pick me. Choose me. Love me. Why does she say that? Because she's unsure of his love for her. Let's look at this command in a different light. Jesus is saying, love God, pick God, choose God. Why does he have to say that? Because he's talking to a people that might not love him back and that do not love him back, but who, but with whom he is in love with, but with whom a people he is obsessed with. And that command becomes a plea. Love me. 
pick me, choose me over and above everything else. Love me. Isaiah 52, all like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his or her own way. But God sends his son. As an act of the will, he chooses us in his freedom and says, I love them still. And on that cross, he chooses to die for us, not for his own sake, but for our sake. God has picked us. He has chosen us. He has loved us. And now the command is to you. Pick God. Love God. Choose God. It's an act of the will. It is discipline. It is obedience. I'll end with this, uh, oh, two things. First, I want to pick on somebody. I mean, can I pick on you, Will? I'll pick on you, because I think you have a microphone on you as well. Uh, yeah. Um, at what point did you know that they loved you? I, after, after I kind of walked out on the relationship, um, before we were married, uh, she took me back when I realized my my error. Um, okay, okay. Wait, no, no, but that's that's you know like she wasn't happy with me. Good, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, of course, the look, I can't imagine. And, and the, look, <laughs> the, the look she gave me seemed to show some sign of doubt in her in her yeah, yeah. commitment. She <laughs> she took me back. Well, let me ask you, Lin Fei. Can I pick on you now? What point did you know that you fell in love with? What What was the day? What was the moment? How did you know? Okay, come on. These, all these people have specific dates, man. But how did you know? What 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 was it like? Oh yeah, you woke up one day and you're like, I just love this guy. Ah, interesting. Very cool. Okay, look. Something happened before that for months. For months, right? Maybe he called you every day before he. we well, there's no phone. Before the first thing he did was maybe wish you good morning. Maybe the little acts of kindness, yes. Ah, I'll cook the dinner. Cook the dinner. These little acts done one after another, after another, and after another. Somehow one day Faye wakes up and says, I think I think I love this. I don't know why, but I think I love it. <laughs> Gotta poke she, at you a little bit. She would think it's a fatal error now. <laughs> it's the same thing with Jesus. How do you know that you love Jesus? The thing is, there's not one passage in the Bible where you miraculously read and you say, Oh, I've now fallen in love with God. There's no one church service you go to and you're like, Oh yeah, that was a perfect thing. Now I'm in love with God. It, it's, it's slow discipline. Little things that you do with God, you do with Jesus on your own time, slowly and slowly and slowly, and he'll do things with you. He'll reveal himself to you every single day. And one day you'll wake up and you'll be like, wait, I didn't read the Bible today and it feels like something's missing. One day you'll be walking around and be like, oh, I didn't pray today. It doesn't feel like a right day. One day you'll be like, I didn't go to church. It doesn't feel right. Something is missing. That's how you know you've fallen in love. But it takes discipline. It takes an act of the will to continue to persevere, to continue your daily practices of reading the Bible, of praying, of fellowship, of church going. And then one day, you'll be like, oh, it feels weird. I'm missing something. And that's how you know, I think I've fallen in love. I think I've fallen in love. But it's every single day. Because one day, I'm sure, I think, I think was it, I don't know who I was having a conversation with in the church. Maybe it was Will and Faye. That was like, oh yeah, I didn't call the other person today. That feels weird. Why haven't I done it yet? Right? That's how you know you fall in love with God. That's how you fall in love with God. Little by little by little. Have you ever given a sweater over to a, a friend, like a knit sweater, and they're just a little bigger than you, right? You give it to them. You think, oh yeah, I'm sure it'll shrink back and I can wear it again. 
So you give it to them, it just gets a little bigger. Then you put it on, you're like, oh yeah, it doesn't fit anymore. Any of you ever done that? Okay, I've done that, okay, I've done that. <laughs> just me, I guess. It's, it's, it's like that. You put it on and you say, something's, something's not right. See, because when God fills you and he fills your heart, it expands just a little bit. When you give yourself to God, your heart just expands a little bit. And then on days when you feel like you're not there and God's not there, you feel something is missing. That's how you know you fall in love. You longing for God, you missing God, you knowing that's weird, you know you fall in love with God. The second is this, my end at this point. How do I love my neighbor as myself? Very practical, very, very practical. How many of you ask your friends, your colleagues, other people, hey, how are you? Everybody does that. And the normal response is, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm okay, or whatever. Here's how you practically love your neighbor. The moment they say, I'm okay, I'm good, or whatever, you, you follow up with this. Tell me more. Tell me more. Because oftentimes we just say, okay, cool, I'll go on my way. I want you to say, tell me more. Because what that does is, is it opens the door for the other person to be more vulnerable with you and for you to encounter their lives. Tell me more. And then see what they say. Oftentimes when I do that, people open up in the most vulnerable way. You know, my life's just been really crappy. I, these are the things that are happening with me. And then that gives me the end. How can I pray for you? What can I do to support you in this? That's you loving them. You can do this even in school. Tell me more. That's just it. Very simple. Tell me more. And see how that little phrase can change your relationship with your neighbor and actually help you love them as yourself. Those are my, uh, that's my time for you this morning. We'll close in prayer. I'll wait for seven awkward seconds for questions and we'll keep going. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who loves us. You loved us so much that you went on that cross for us, not because you wanted anything from us, but for our sake to save us from death and to give us eternal life. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you have commanded us to love. Help us have the discipline of love, to be freely loving, and to be bound to you. Because, Lord, perfect freedom is in bondage to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Questions, comments, thoughts? Oh, yes. Sure, okay. So, uh, my friend is just a little bigger than me, so when I give it to him, I, and that sweater expanded. Uh, every time I wear it, 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 used to wear it, it reminded me that he had worn it because it just got a little bigger. That gap was a reminder that somebody else has been here, right? And it reminded me of him. In the same way, when God fills our heart, our heart expands just a little bit. And so when he's not there anymore, we feel, wait, he's not there. Something's missing. And that's how you know, hey, God has filled me. I've changed. Now I need him. And that need for him is a... Is a is an indication that you've actually fallen in love with him. That you can recognize his non-presence, recognize when he's not there, is an indication that you have been filled with the Holy Spirit and that you love God. Does that make sense? No, 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 go for it. Like, just me with my friend? Uh, no. <laughs> it just didn't fit me. Uh, but all analogies fail at, one, at some point. And that's the point. This analogy breaks down. I do not like wearing that sweater. Uh, but in the case of the heart, that recognition that, hey, it's gotten bigger is actually very interesting. Because I recognize this, that, hey, I know I've been filled. Yeah, and my heart is bigger. 
Well, that's how I lost that sweater because even though, <laughs> like I say, lost it, like I could never wear it again because it got bigger and it got whoosh, really small in the dryer. A knit sweater. I could never wear that sweater again. All because I had one guy. Put it on the roof. I no longer have it. This is a long time ago. Uh, that's where our service ends. I'm assuming we've done the Apostles' Creed. No, we didn't. Oh, we didn't do the Apostles' Creed. Would you all please stand if you're able for the Apostles' Creed? So together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confession. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us therefore confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us share with one another a sign of our peace. Well, it's okay that I click on you. <laughs> Our offertory hymn, this four hundred and twenty. Thank you. Oh, I love the song.
And tell no, we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, tell no, we are Christians by our love. Praise to the Father from whom all things come. And no praise to Christ Jesus in Romans. And no praise to the Spirit who makes things us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. We are Christians by our love. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures near below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, for your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, through whom you have created all. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, He stretched out His hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so, he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now, with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord of heaven and earth, heaven and earth, are full of your glory. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna. Sing Hosanna, sing Alleluia. Please be seated. Holy and gracious God. Accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread, gave you thanks, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your holy church, gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And now, 
the Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, these are the gifts of God given for you, the people of God.
body fat properly. Okay. About a fresh box, we should be. Having received this holy food, this holy food, let us pray. God, our guide, you have fed us with bread from heaven as you feed the people of Israel. May we who have been inwardly nourished be ready to follow you all our days. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you all please stand as you're able for the blessing. <coughs> May God the Father bless you and remind you of his love for you. May the cross remind you of God's redeeming love in your life. May the blessing of the Holy Spirit enable you to go into this world and love others. May the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Our recessional hymn is 415. Showing by our 